Amazon is worth $1.6 trillion. In today's video, we're gonna talk about what percentage of their total market cap they spent to acquire MGM Studios, why they need the IP of James Bond and Rocky, and if politicians will ever actually bring viable antitrust regulation against the behemoth in Seattle. It is Wednesday, June 2nd. This is the Piper Rundown. We analyze business and culture to help you win. Today's rundown is presented by JetStore. JetStore has been providing affordable, reliable, and easy to manage data storage and cloud solutions to over 4,000 customers worldwide for more than 26 years. That's longer than I've been alive. JetStore offers storage systems for private cloud hosting, video surveillance, internet of things, AI, machine learning, edge computing, data archiving, HPC, media production, medical imaging, and flight simulation. For more details, visit jetstore.com. They can help you with so much stuff. Big news from last week is that Amazon is acquiring MGM Studios in an 8.45 billion, billion dollar deal. That was, that was a good one. What's fascinating is before this deal was conducted, MGM was valued at about five and a half billion, depending on who you talk to, five, six billion for one of the very few remaining independent movie studios. The big players um, outside of Sony mm -hmm. have really uh, kind of put up their walls oh, yeah. and started to build their own uh, structure involving the distribution of the content and the creation of that content. The only other player like MGM that was uh, for a long time selling arms to the different uh, battlers in the streaming wars it, uh, is Sony Pictures and MGM. Sony continues to be that supplier, uh, but MGM now joins forces with Amazon and they originally said that they didn't want to sell for anything less than 10 billion. Which is a great negotiating tactic, but when you're overpaying for the enterprise value of something, it's okay. very, very hard to take that to a board and have them say no. This is Amazon's second largest acquisition ever, 13.7 billion for Whole Foods, uh, which wasn't as recent. I was like in my head, I was like, oh, it was just a couple years ago, actually a while ago, but that's how life works, continues to accelerate. Uh, Hannah, tell the good folks a little bit about MGM and their IP that Amazon now gets access to. So their IP is massive. They have made over 4,000 films and 17,000 episodes of TV. Uh, some of the most popular being Handmaid's Tale. Uh, they developed Fargo and uh, their most popular movie franchise, which I'm sure you're familiar, is Bond, James Bond. And this is just ridiculous IP to have. And a lot of people think of MGM, The Roaring Lion, like the classics with The Wizard of Oz and all those old black and white films. I remember Tom and Jerry, particularly, coming from MGM. Um, it's a very nostalgic brand, and they really haven't had too, too many recent slam dunks, which I think, in my opinion, that's it's smart that they're partnering with Amazon because Amazon has the bucks to actually like produce upon this IP. I think one of the things that we're seeing a ton in recent years with these movie studios and um, and stream streaming wars is like people are making reproductions of content and choosing to build out worlds. We see this with Marvel and Disney Plus iterating and iterating upon their successful franchises. And so I think that's something to expect from this MGM deal with Amazon. And MGM has been around for a very long time, back since the silent movie area fo founded when it was formed in 1924. Uh, and one of the kind of legacy stories of the, me the movie industry is that they used to be completely verticalized. So they would own everything from the impetus of the movie all the way to the theater. In 1959, they were forced to spin out Lowe's theaters, which used to be part of the MGM universe, um, and have definitely descended in power to some degree, uh, but also sold their old library. So when we talk about stuff like Call, um, Call of the Wild, what was it called? Not Call of the Wild. Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz and um, I, the other OG one. Yeah, I know exactly what you're, it's on the tip of my what? brain. Those are no longer in this library. Those were sold off back in the day. And what happened with MGM to prepare them for the sales, they were bought by a hedge fund that basically pulled back all the distribution deals. So that was actually value decreasing for someone to acquire the business because you think about it, 
uh, like The Office used to be on Netflix. Yes. If it's on Netflix, that makes NBC and Peacock's uh, streaming service significantly less valuable right. and their IP isn't being fully realized from the standpoint of generating subscribers for an SVOD service. And so MGM, with no intentions of going their own route with an SVOD service, pulled back all the distribution, made themselves an acquisition target, and the uh, investors and the players that made that the goal are gonna be super successful. Um, let's talk about Amazon for a little bit. Starting with uh, their first big pivot with Prime Video, so they started trying to basically do the Netflix approach, uh, run a lot of experiments, kill their bad bets as quickly as possible mm -hmm. and let their winners ride. They've seen some success, they've won some awards, they've had a few uh, series like The Marvelous Miss Maisel and Transparent, but nothing that you would categorize as just like transcendent, like culture defining stuff. Yes. Which is really what they're after with both the acquisition here to have, I would say, James Bond and Rocky sit in that nexus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then similarly, they bought the rights to Lord of the Rings a couple years ago and are in the midst of uh, an immensely, immensely expensive production for a new uh, saga, a new chapter to the Lord of the Rings yeah. um, series of content. So those are their big bets. And in the streaming wars, um, what John Malone did a really, really great interview with CNBC. People know I'm a fan of him if they're a regular viewer of The Rundown. And he was talking about how there's these two ends. You need the exceptionally cheap, you know, innings eater, to use one of your baseball analogy, type of shows that keep you there once you're on the service. Mm -hmm. But you need the tentpole, uh, huge franchise IPs as a customer acquisition vehicle. Totally. So you think about Disney, you think about um, Elsa and all the people from Frozen. Mm -hmm. You think about uh, the whole Marvel universe. You think about these other uh, Star Wars, like Tenpo IP, that if you are a super fan of that genre, you're buying their service no matter what because yeah. you need access to that, but it's everything else that keeps you there. In the HBO Max goal, they're, they're saying Harry Potter, they're right. saying Game of Thrones, and then if you have like the you know little like barely moving hamster wheel going, maybe you stick around for Big Bang Theory. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but fun. but the idea here with Amazon Prime is number one, they get to monetize similar to Disney in routes other than just paying for the service via their Prime uh, total package. Mm -hmm. But something like James Bond, if you're a James Bond super fan is the type of thing that could get you there, similarly with Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. They are not spending as much as some of these other players on content, 11 billion last year, which sounds like a ton, until you recognize that the Discovery HBO Max combo is gonna be over 20 billion. Yeah. Netflix is in a similar arena, uh, but Prime has all these other accoutrements to keep you into their bundle. They're also paying for Thursday night uh, exclusive NFL football games. So they are they're having a very concentrated uh, bet into expanding their media empire. I mean, combined, this is almost 20 billion in in content and stream, like to get people watching Amazon Prime as opposed to other streaming platforms. And why did they do that? Someone who does not have a Prime membership spends about $600 a year on Prime and those that do have Prime spend about $1,500 per year. So when you keep add that into the recurring predictable revenue of that subscription, that is what they are after here with uh, keeping people into the bundle. And we talked about the AT&T deal, which we're actually gonna briefly mention at the end here. The reason AT&T Warner didn't work is because Warner, horizontal, trying to reach as many people as possible yeah. from a media standpoint, and AT&T is a very vertical business, a very zero-sum game. No one pays for T-Mobile, Verizon, and AT&T. You're switching out a SIM card, and, SIM card and putting a new SIM card in when you get in. These media SVOD services, there will be a multitude of winners, and it is not mutually exclusive. It is not zero-sum. Maybe you like uh, Frozen and Harry Potter, so you're going to have Disney and HBO Max. Maybe I love James Bond and... Uh, house of Cards, mm -hmm. so I'm going to be on Netflix and Amazon Prime. It is not exclusive. All they need is number one, the pieces of IP that get you there no matter what, and enough of the IP, the, the catalog, which Amazon is now approaching, mm -hmm. to retain you and keep you entertained if that is your exclusive means of media consumption. Yeah, this is like, I don't know, it, it definitely is making waves in the streaming wars. Amazon's moving on up. One thing that will constrain them though, unlike Marvel and some of these other franchises, 
Michael Wilson and Barbara Broccoli, the heirs to the Bond estate, still hold creative control for the show. And there's rumblings, maybe they wanted to do more, maybe they didn't, but they've been very, very uh, protective of the Bond brand. You do not see the same amount of paraphernalia and, and other items sold associated with Bond that you do with some of these other franchises. And that's because they see this as a more um, kind of exclusive piece of IP. Mm -hmm. So while Amazon will get to distribute all that, they will not have the full control Control of building out a universe right. a la Marvel and some of these others. And I would argue that that's not a guaranteed winner because for as successful as Marvel has been, DC Comics has done an absolutely, uh, on a relative basis, garbage job of building yeah. out the DC universe despite the fact that they have a ton of yeah. similar tentpole IP. So that's why that estate will continue to probably protect Bond in a relatively narrow sense mm -hmm. and why we can't guarantee that despite Amazon's great success that rolling out Lord of the Rings and James Bond and Rocky universes is not going to be a guarantee of them winning in the streaming world. Yeah. There is a rumor that... Um the the Duke of Hastings from the from the Bridgerton series on Netflix the Simon what what is the actor's name I don't know something but there's a rumor that he's going to be the next James Bond and if that's the case like that's like even dunking harder on Netflix with this Amazon deal that's prime that's some prime actor material right there <laughs> that's all on Hannah too. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about antitrust and the idea here that a lot of politicians making a lot of noise about, oh my gosh, Amazon, this acquisition should be illegal, anti-monopoly, antitrust concerns. And I'm not going to be completely dismissive of it, but this acquisition does not put them at number one mm -hmm. or number two for SVOD service subscriptions. So they are by no way, shape, or means a monopoly in that domain. And as we've alluded to, there's still a number of players. There's much consolidation yet to come in the streaming wars. And so the question here is, are politicians going to use this as an opportunity to dunk? And this is both sides of the aisle, left and right. Both sides of the aisle to dunk, to score points, to help their political careers. Will there be any action behind it? Do they have any capacity to actually act on what they're saying? I'm deeply skeptical of that. The core argument, if you watch the antitrust hearings against Bezos and, and Amazon was, you guys put retailers on your platform, you take the data from those retailers and use it to inform your own private labels, giving you an unfair advantage in retail despite the fact that Target, Walmart, every grocery store has their own bevy of private labels and from a total pie of retail perspective, Amazon is far from a monop monopoly in that domain. If you're telling me that them owning MGM is now pushing them over the edge into monopoly status, there's not really a coherent argument there. No. Similarly, the other basis for all antitrust regulation is consumer harm. Consumer harm through the lens of if there are only two providers for say cell service and because of that duopoly they can extort you for exorbitant amounts of money because this is a near essential service then that's also harmful to the consumer who's getting harmed by paying the same rate for their prime subscription and now getting this access to an entire eight billion dollar library of ip that they otherwise wouldn't have yeah where's the harm there is there is none so it's going to be exceptionally hard to argue and it is going to be um, a really interesting continuing dynamic of what actually happens in these antitrust concerns. We said that we thought Google was one of the more at-risk players of the big tech. Yep. We thought that Microsoft arguably was this wildly overlooked entity compared to some of the other players out there. And at the end of the day, Amazon, which is worth $1.6 trillion, used less basically used a half of a percent of their total market capitalization right. to acquire this media entity. And they'll be a leader in media. They are, they're growing as an advertiser. But the arguments for antitrust remain. And I'm sure they, you know, red team uh, this whole scenario. Super hard to find. Yep. I agree. Cool. Well, that's a rundown. That is the rundown. Uh, Warner Brothers announced the name of their new spinoff for, uh, with Discovery. Did you hear the name of this? I did not. Warner Brothers Discovery. That's the name of their uh, SVOD Man, service. I just am in awe of these creative <laughs> geniuses out here. $20 billion in annual spend. Uh, the antitrust there was 
even stupider than anything we just argued about. Um, AT&T acquiring Warner was like this big antitrust concern and like the lawyers who were about that were dunking on it when in fact the deal never made sense. It was never going to create a monopoly. Similarly, and uh, there will be, once again, predicted by John Malone, more mergers to come. He's interested in finding a way to spin the NBC Universal uh, IP into Warner Brothers Discovery. That would be a formidable foe. Um, but the budgets still remain behind Netflix and Disney. So the streaming wars continue. When large enterprises compete, you win. Let us know in the comments what you're watching.